we really saw um, the testing efforts that are ramping up and all the potential problems and, and um, difficulties we're going to try to overcome to do it. So just to, to re-summarize really quickly, I thought it was a cool statistic. We're doing over 600,000 tests a day in the U.S. now, and that's not enough, as we we're already discussing. I mean, we really need to test more, trace, isolate people. Uh, we need more tests to uh, really get a hold of the pandemic. But at least um, it's pretty cool to see how much the testing effort has ramped up. And since we're doing so much effort, it, it, so much testing, it's really important to understand uh, just what we're what we're looking at. What's the sensitivity? What the specificity? Like, are we really detecting uh, who we want to detect? So, just as a, a, a quick review, I'm sure everybody already knows this already. But uh, so, the qPCR test, we're isolating RNA from you know, patient samples, an oral swab or a, a sputum or fecal swab. Uh, we're putting it in a tube with some SARS-CoV-2 specific primers. Uh, add some reverse transcriptase and polymerase, uh, put it in a thermocycler and, and let it amplify. And if there's SARS-CoV-2 RNA in the tube, then in a, you should uh, amplify, make a bunch of DNA, and there's a fluorescent dye in the tube that, that turns fluorescent if, the, if there's a bunch of DNA. And you only get a bunch of DNA if there's a, a SARS-CoV-2 uh, template to amplify. So in a perfect world, you get a, a curve kind of like this, uh, in the bottom right, where you see that you get tons and tons of DNA. So there was a template there. And in a perfect world, if there's no SARS-CoV-2 in the sample, then you don't see these curves. You, it's just flat. You don't get any amplification. And so today we're kind of going to discuss, uh, is this a perfect world or how far off from a perfect world are we? And so like we were just discussing, there's a lot of talk of ramping up these tests even more. Uh, we're trying to get students back in school, get businesses started, get kids back in school. And so there's talk of testing weekly for, like Yale just announced testing weekly. Uh, we were just discuss, discussing doing it weekly. So there's a lot of tests. We're trying to catch these people when they're pre-symptomatic or asymptomatic. Uh, in an ideal world, again, if someone's symptomatic, uh, they're hopefully going to start isolating. And so if we really want to get a hold on things, we got to we got to catch these pre-symptomatic cases. But uh, the problem with this is there's a recent paper in the Annals of Internal Medicine uh, by Kusurka et al. And they suggest that these pre-symptomatic uh, tests are going to be pretty difficult. So they say, over the four days of infection before the typical, typical time of symptom onset, the probability of a false negative result in an infected person decreases from 100% on day one to 67% on day four, although there is considerable uncertainty. And so they're saying four days prior to symptom onset, it's basically impossible to detect if a person has SARS-CoV-2. And even just the day prior to symptom onset, you're 70% likely to miss a person. And so that that's kind of throwing a wrench in all the plans and, and it's definitely a big worry. Like, are we just going to waste all our effort designing these these cool pre-symptomatic screening tests? And so here I'm going to argue that no, it's not a waste of effort. The, the, the way this data was analyzed might not have been optimal. We might be putting a little too much trust in sparse data. And so uh, I'm going to develop an a alternative way to analyze it and also um, add in some additional data that's been published that kind of makes things clear. And so first, we should kind of dig into exactly what what the the Kusurka paper is um, suggesting. So here's the we just read the text for it. Here's kind of the graphical summary, and uh, you can see early in infection, they're saying there's no chance of detecting virus. Uh, you get a decent chance around the onset of symptoms with the stash line, and then uh, it peaks a couple of days after the onset of symptoms, like we just heard, and decreases as the virus starts to clear. And so that's um, that, that's worrisome. It's kind of a little bit of a misnomer, this x-axis. It says days since exposure, but if you dig into the data, so the data on the, the raw data is on the right, and all their data is days since on, symptom onset. Like really, very few patients know when they are exposed, exactly when they're exposed. And it's, it, it's symptom onset that you get from these patients. And so in this paper, they just took the symptom onset, subtracted five days, and said, that was the days since exposure. But I think to, to 
really dig into this, you, you don't want to make an assumption like that. And so really what the data is, is days since symptoms. So we have days since symptoms at, at the day of symptom onset, you have, they're saying you have about uh, 60, like a 30, 40% chance of, of missing uh, a, a person that's infected. Uh, three to four days prior to the symptom onset, you have no chance of detecting the virus, according to this data. But when you start to dig into the data a little, there's not a lot of raw data. It's hard to interpret in this plot, but in this bottom left here is all the data prior to the onset of symptoms. And so if you, the same data just presented a little differently. So we're, we're showing bars where uh, the, the dark shading is positive detections, the light shading is negative. And so the total height of the bar is how many tests you have. And if you look over here prior to the onset of symptoms, uh, those little scrapes there are single tests. So there is three single tests in a single patient in a single study. And so that's that's where we're, we're drawing these strong conclusions that it's impossible to detect much before onset of symptoms. And so that's, that's a, a little worrisome, kind of as a, a thought experiment for why that's so worrisome. Like what, what we're saying there is sort of like you saw a quarter on the street, it's tails up, and then some stranger walks up to you and says, uh, let, let's flip the coin. If it comes up heads, uh, I'll give you a dollar. But if it comes up tails, you give me a thousand dollars. And so that that's, you don't really have to be a statistician or a, a gambler. Like that's not a great bet. But that's effectively what we're doing here. We're saying we're 100% certain that if we test a patient five days prior to symptom onset, there's 0% chance we'll detect it. We're, we have 100% chance of missing it. And that's all based on the single test that four days prior to symptom onset. So it, it, it's, it's worrisome. It, it, it makes you wonder if you could analyze it alternatively. And the, the really good thing about this paper is that they, they put all their data, all their code up on GitHub. And so anybody that wants to can look at it, dig into it, and maybe develop an alternative way to analyze things. And so one alternative way to analyze things would be like a a Bayesian autoregressive moving average state space model. And so that, that's a, a whole bunch of words to describe something that's really pretty simple. So uh, just to break it down, uh, a state space model just means you you can't really observe what you want to. Like they uh, they developed it for tracking rockets from radar, uh, radar tracks. And so the, the radar track is noisy, so you're trying to predict where exactly the rocket is, but you can't tell for sure because there's so much noise. And so here we have the same problem. We want to uh, try to predict the, the true prediction rate, the true detection rate, how well we can detect the virus, but we only have counts that are noisy. That's the state space part. Uh, then we, if we kind of back up, so the previous model was using a polynomial assumption. So kind of assuming that the detection rate fits like a, a U shape on the data, but uh, that, that might be more assumptions than we want to make. So we, we could kind of back up a little and try to reduce it to the simplest assumption we can make. And, one simple assumption would be that today is pretty similar to yesterday. So if you were really good at detecting yesterday, probably we're going to be uh, pretty good at detecting today too. It's not a rule, but if you had to guess, you're going to say, no, oh, probably today is pretty similar to yesterday with, with some variation. And we can kind of go a little further with that. So like if we saw two days ago to yesterday, we saw the rates decrease. And three days ago to two days ago, we saw the rate decrease. We see this consistent decrease, we could guess, you know, probably today the rates are going to decrease even more. We're kind of on a downward trend. If we had to guess, we'd, we'd guess that trend's going to continue. Again, not not 100% guessing it, but just, just kind of informing our decisions. And that's the moving average part. If we include, so all of this has been kind of framed with, uh, given yesterday, what, what happens today? And so at some point we need to to start the model. We can't always say yesterday. And so the Bayesian part of the model is uh, sort of a way to get around that. So in a Bayesian framework, you can put a prior on something. You can say, I think 20 days prior to, to symptom onset, it's pretty unlikely we're going to detect the virus. And that, that, that seems to fit with the virology that we understand so far. So we can just say, we, we really don't think we're going to detect you know, three weeks prior to somebody uh, having symptoms. And then based on that, we can sort of try to see if we can get better predictions out of this data, or at least more more trustworthy or 
less um, less over overconfident predictions. So here's the polynomial model that we were already talking about. Uh, three or four days prior to the onset of symptoms, uh, the, the model's super confident that we can't detect. So now we have probability of detection on the y-axis days before or after onset of symptoms on the x-axis. And so uh, the shading is the 95% confidence interval. And so when you have a small confidence interval, you're, you're really sure you, you know something well. You're 100% confident that this is the right answer. And that's what we see in the polynomial model, like we were discussing. And so if we fit the Bayesian model, uh, we were discussing to the, the same data, same data, uh, different interpretation. So in the blue, we have uh, autoregressive model where we're, we're just assuming that yesterday looks a bit like today. And so uh, after the onset of symptoms, the two models really agree. But before the onset of symptoms, where we really have sparse data, uh, we, we start to see a pretty big divergence between the models. And even more divergent is the confidence we have. So the, the Bayesian model has a large confidence interval, the light blue shading uh, versus the, the small one we were already discussing in the, the polynomial model. And so usually a, a large confidence interval is a bad thing, but here, I think it's sort of reflecting what we're actually seeing in the data. Like you wouldn't want to bet a lot of money on that single test. But that's all a bit academic. How do we know which one actually is better? Which model is, is more likely to be a good fit to the data? And so luckily we have some new data. So here's the data I already showed you with the three tests prior to the onset of symptoms. Uh, I dug up seven additional studies with uh, 100 more patients. Uh, 20 patients prior to the onset of symptoms. And we get um, we get a decent amount of data prior to the onset of symptoms. It's still not a ton of data, but it's enough that we can start seeing how our previous predictions were. And just sort of as a, a, a first test, we could look like five days prior to the onset of symptoms, we have four patients that tested positive and one that tested negative. So an 80% detection rate. And that, that would seem to imply that it's not impossible to detect it five days prior to the onset of symptoms. So it seems like um, the polynomial model is definitely failing there. And we can compare uh, the, the Bayesian model that, that I developed to without the data. So in the blue, we, what is the curve we saw previously, where the model didn't know, knew only three tests prior to the onset of symptoms. And in the red, we have the new model with uh, a bunch of additional data. And we can see that the two models largely agree. So it seems like the naive model, where we didn't know much about the onset of symptoms, was uh, pretty correct about um, how confident it was and, and making a good, a good stab at the prediction rates. Uh, one little tidbit in this is that all, all the studies I, did, I collected are more recently published, and those studies seem to be slightly higher detection rates. The red curve is a bit higher than the blue curve. So it could be. It's hard to tell because all these studies have patient populations and assay error conflated together, but it's possible that we're getting better at these assays. But uh, that's just a, a potential possibility, not something you'd want to bet on. I thought it was interesting. And so just looking at the final model using all the data, uh, we can start to see prior to the onset of symptoms, do we have a chance of detecting virus? And so it seems like, yes, we, we're probably going to be able to detect virus. Like three days, two, three days prior to the onset of symptoms, we have a 75% chance of detecting virus, five days prior, maybe a 50% chance. And uh, like eight days prior, we're down to 25% like chance of detecting virus. So it, it's certainly not perfect, and there's no guarantee we're going to get every person. But if we could detect 50% of people prior to the onset of symptoms, Potentially prior to the most infectious periods, maybe we can we can cut down a lot of this pre-symptomatic or asymptomatic spread and and really reduce the the reproductive rate of this virus. And if we can really catch those patients, I think we could have a a pretty significant effect. This, these pre-symptomatic screenings could could really uh, help us out. And so that that's the main conclusions. Uh, we saw that it's pretty important that we fully account for uncertainty. We don't start making strong conclusions where we have little data. Uh, we saw that detection prior to the onset of symptoms isn't, isn't that bad. It's not perfect, of course, but we have a decent chance based on this data of detecting many patients prior to the onset of symptoms. And this, this data was all opportunistically collected. It's from different countries, different patient populations, different assays, 
different researchers. So it's not perfect, but it's the best data we have now. And hopefully, as these screening protocols get online, then we'll get tons more data and really get to, to really uh, nail down exactly how well we're doing and how what our chances are of detecting this. And so this is, uh, it's currently submitted to BioArchive. There's a couple day delay while they get it up. So uh, in the meantime, it's on GitHub if uh, you want to read it or make any comments or, or fork off your own version and do a better model or add your own data. Uh, so it, it's available and hopefully uh, it can inform testing going forward. 